Oft times we hear people, and maybe some of us have been guilty of it too, of complaining uh, against God as to why he didn't do thus and so. And it basically comes down to this, the way I think it ought to be done. <laughs> Well, let's keep in mind the reason we have a Bible is so we'll know the Lord's will. And we'll know how He wants it done, how it ought to be done, how it should be done. That's the whole reason for the Bible. And we find that made clear several places, but in one most familiar to Bible students, Paul's statement to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. And the word perfect, as you know, means complete, and in this case, complete spiritually before God, and thereby, because you're complete spiritually, you're acceptable to God. Now, the Old Testament in various ways points out that well, just to sum it up, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end there are over the ways of death. Now, when you start trying to think about godly matters and spiritual matters, matters of morality, and you do so without the knowledge of God's Word, then you're more than apt to come up with the wrong perspective, the wrong idea. And that's done every day, and thus Hosea the prophet said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And as Jeff will point out a while back, I think it was you, Jeff, that concerning Hosea, and if it wasn't you, it ought to have been pointed out by you, <laughs> that there's more to than just the fact that we're destroyed out of our ignorance of the Word of God. You can know the Word of God, you can know it wrongly divided, and we're to rightly divide it. There wasn't a proper way to handle it. You handle it the way you want to and come up with the will of heaven. There wouldn't be a statement in there explicitly saying, rightly divide the Word of truth. So you can misuse the Bible, even acknowledging it to be the Word of God. Then, of course, even knowing the truth, as it's set out in given subject, as you look throughout the Bible, regarding whatever that topic may be, you can reason incorrectly with the truth. Now, some people think that the laws of logic are human-made. They're not. They're really taking the fact that man by nature is a logical being and simply through a, uh, studying how one draws a correct conclusion about anything, then one sees the laws of correct reasoning set out. And many people don't realize that if a position you take as what ought to be God would have it be this way. This is right. If that position, that premise, implies a false doctrine, then the premise itself is false. Now, it doesn't mean you know the truth on it, but it means you know the Bible well enough to see if that position implies a false doctrine, then you need to go back and rethink what you're doing and possibly restudy to make sure you've got all of what the Bible teaches on a given subject before you start your reasoning with it. And I see a great amount of that going on, and I guess it always will be, in the whole land and the world and has been for since man's been here. So we're concerned about not only how to study the Bible to ascertain the authority of the Lord as we sang about a while ago regarding whatever we believe, whatever we practice, but we realize that part of the rules of Bible interpretation has to do with the way we think. And when you study through the Scriptures, God's Word is saying, and He knows how He made us, so He knows what we can do with our minds if we, if we choose to. And that's going to come up in a minute, if we choose to. Then we need to think correctly. So come let us reason together. Isaiah said on behalf of God to the people He was called to prophesy to. Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Well, reasoning with the rightly divided word will get you to the truth. But now there's something that gets rather interesting when people want to criticize God. You go over to 1 John chapter 4, and the scripture says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Verse 8. 
1 John 4, verse 8. It's the last part of that verse I want to concentrate on this morning. For God is love. Whatever is God, His essence, His divine essence, it doesn't begin, it doesn't end, it happens eternity, and all the great attributes of God issue from that essence because the attributes come from His nature and His nature comes from what He is. His essence has no beginning and has no ending and all of His attributes reflect that. He's all-knowing, ever-present, all-powerful, and so on. So he is love because that's a part of his divine essence. It's just what he is. Now I have to study the word of God, the revealed mind of that God who is love, that I might be able to know God as well as I can know God while I walk in this fleshly body on this earth. There are many general things we can know about deity through what's called natural revelation in the world such as if you've got design, there has to be a designer. But if I'm really to get into knowing God as best a human can, I'm going to have to go to where He has revealed Himself more distinctly and particularly to mankind. That's what we noticed in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's in the Bible, the revealed mind of God. Put on our level of understanding in words that I can understand and thus what I'm going to know about God is going to be based upon what the Bible says. Now watch this. And the correct reasoning from the truth in the Bible about God. And that gets into implication. God is love. All right, now hold that. I don't think anybody here who knows and believes what the Bible says about God is going to say God is not love. We might need, and we do, study, as we've tried to do here over the years, more about what the agape love of God is. That it has nothing to do with strictly an emotional thing. It doesn't rule out emotions. It just simply means if this comes from God and God expresses His will concerning my obligations to Him in the words of the Bible, then I should be happy and display these emotions that God has given me when I know I have complied with His will and discharged my obligations to Him because that's what it means to be faithful. That's what real faithfulness is. Just read James 2 and you'll see, you'll see that it's not just a, an affirming intellectually that God is, but it is a carrying out of His will. It's not even saying that, yes, that's what the Bible says and we ought to do it. It is the doing of it. Take an Old Testament example. Simple one, Noah. Noah was faithful when he did what God told him. And as I most often say, the way he told him for the reason he told him. So verse 22 of Genesis 6 says, Of Noah thus did Noah. According to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now that's that man's personal belief, confidence, and trust in God based upon the Word of God. And in this case, having to do with the salvation of Noah and his family from the great flood that would destroy all the wicked in the whole world. And you have to go back earlier in chapter 6 to read about that. So a saving faith is an obedient faith. A saving faith takes God at His word. A saving faith is a confidence, trust, belief, and faith that says the Bible says it, and I'm doing it. <laughs> it's just that simple. So I said most often, and it would do good to test ourselves in this way, when you say, I believe this, that, or the other regarding God, or what God enjoins upon man, I must be able to go to His Word and find a thus saith the Lord for what I say I believe. Our faith, because it comes by hearing the Word of God, must be built upon a thus saith the Lord proposition. When we say faith comes by hearing the Word of God, and we say it because the Bible says it, Romans 10, 17, then we're saying my personal confidence in God is based upon what He told me. Now, if my personal confidence and trust and belief in God is based on something other than what His Word reveals to me. I don't have a right to believe that. I have no authority from God to believe something His Word does not say I should believe. 
So when the Bible, the Word of God, the revelation of the mind of God, says that God is love, and I understand that kind of love wills good as he defines good to everybody. Thus, he's not willing that any should perish, Peter said, but that all should come to repentance. Now, when we bring repentance into it, we're talking about what a human being must do. Because God wants to be saved, but he can't be saved unless he repents. He would have all men be saved, but men must come to repentance. Well, there must be then in man power to turn from a wrong way, as the Bible sets out, the right way, we think, comparing contrast, to say, well, I'm going the wrong way. The Bible says this way. I turn from the way contrary to the teaching of the Bible, or that's authorized by the New Testament, which we sang a while ago is the only way we can be acceptable to God and be one with one another in unity. And then turn to the way revealed of God's will for me in the Word of God. That's an act of faith. It's an act of faith. But where did this power to turn from one way against God to another way for God, as the Bible tells us He wants us to go? Because there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is a way of death. So how can I keep myself from going down the way that leads to eternal separation from God and the devil's hell forevermore? Well, it's obvious God thinks we have the power to know right from wrong. And we have the power to turn from the right as the Bible sets, or from the wrong as the Bible sets out uh, the right in the Bible to the, to the right. To turn from the wrong to the right. It's that simple. From the wrong to the right. Thus, there must be a recognition down in the depths of my mind on the basis of the standard of the Word of God as it teaches me whatever is contrary to that authority manifest in the Word of God, the revelation of His mind to us to guide me. And we did say something about lead me gently on, didn't we? That's going to involve my will willing to be led. You all remember that. God can't save you unless you cooperate with Him. He cannot save anybody unless man cooperates with him. And so we're taught, receive with meekness, the right attitude toward God and his word, the engrafted, implanted word, which is able to save my soul. It's able to save you. You don't cooperate with God, the revelation of God's mind, teaching you your obligation to him will not save you. So you have to have the power to turn. Where did that power to turn come from? Well, it's, it's given to us of God. That is a, a part of our being as God created us. So I want you to keep that in mind because, again, we come back to the fact God is love, and that means he wills us the best that is possible for man, which ultimately and finally is eternal life in heaven with him. Thus, there must be conditions laid down for man to believe in and to comply with and thereby be faithful and go to heaven. And 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that's the purpose of your Bible. Add to that James 1, verse 27 in like verses. And it's obvious we're expected to lend our minds the study of the revealed mind of God pertaining to our salvation. So the Bible pertains to our salvation. That's what's in God's mind in giving us down through all those hundreds and thousands of years the gradual unfolding of how he would save man from his sins, how he would reconcile lost man to himself, and he remained God, and yet he deals with the sin problem so that man can act actually be erased of any guilt because of sin because God can forgive sins but it's on what basis well it's on the basis of Christ having done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves and being tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin and going to the cross and as a perfect being dying on behalf of other people and through the teaching of the scriptures faith comes by hearing the word of God regarding Christ I receive with meekness the engrafted word. I submit to the will of heaven that demonstrates to God my love of him and faith in him and his system to save me from my sins by my faith in Christ that he has atoned for my sins. Now, all of that means that I've got to resign my mind to change to follow the teaching of the Bible. And anything in my mind that's against the teaching of the Bible cannot be right because of what God is. And I'm his creature. Well, I want you to hold all that. I want you to go back over here, remembering that God is love. His very essence is love. What that love is, he wills good, ultimately, salvation and eternity in heaven with him to all mankind. Now, where did man get this will? Well, if you go back over to the book of Genesis, 
and you find out about the creation, you'll find in verse 26, the persons of the Godhead are speaking to one another. And in verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Quickly, we dispense with the idea that would be the physical body of man made in his image because God doesn't have a physical body. So our spirits, the very essence of what our spirits are, reflect God in his eternal spirit. Let us make man in our image. He's talking about the moral nature of God. And it means also that we have willpower. We can make choices. And that brings on a whole another view of things that so many people don't think about when it comes to God creating this world and why he made it like it is. It's not original with me, and I very little I preach is. <laughs> but this world's perfect for what God made it to be. Now I've got to ask the question, well, why am I here in the flesh in this world? Or, why is any other person created here on this world? Why is the world doing like it's doing? Well, it's a place to get ready for heaven. Why didn't God make us to where we couldn't sin? Why didn't He just make us people who don't have choices? And then we wouldn't go around shooting folks. Why did he give us the opportunity to violate his will, sin, and in so doing and hurt on ourselves and on other people? Why did, why did he do that? Sure, that means God's not love. For if he had loved us, he wouldn't have permitted us to commit sin. I watch parents raising their children all along, and they try to build a hedge around them. They try to make little automatons out of them. But the key to raising children is to rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, which teaches them they have a choice. And when they make wrong choices, letting the Bible be the standard, which it is, of what's right and wrong, and they make wrong choices, they will suffer the consequences. God is love, and He made Adam and Eve, and He made Adam and Eve in His image, and it wasn't very long before Adam and Eve did what? Well, did he love Adam and Eve to put them into that garden and then make them in such a way that they had the power of choice, thus they could make a wrong choice? And they did. Shouldn't God be ashamed of himself for being a God of love? Maybe he's not a God of love. If he had been a God of love, why would he have permitted Adam and Eve to sin? Well, one of the arguments for God being a God of love is that a God of love makes it possible for man to make choices. That he wouldn't really love man if he just said, you're going to heaven. And you don't even know what it's right to sin or to repent of sins or to choose right over wrong and be blessed by choosing the right and punished when you do wrong. You just, what would heaven be to somebody like that? So this world's perfect for what God made it to be and it's a place to get ready for heaven and it involves man having the power to choose. Any time you give freedom to a person, you must allow for his power to choose. And when you give him his power to choose, guess what he's going to do more times than not? Read your Bible. What's it say? He's going to choose wrong. And people suffer for it. But that didn't reflect on God. Seems to me, and this may have been in the mind of the founding fathers of this country though we can say none of them are really New Testament Christians, when they thought about certain inalienable rights, they were trying to say the way God has made man, regardless of the concept of God, the way the Creator has made man, tells us something about us and about God. Now we have the revelation of God's mind. He tells us about our creation. He says plainly we're made in His image. The moral likeness of God. A sense of a oughtness that says it ought to be this way. There's a standard to live by and you violated the standard. Now your conscience ought to work you over and make you feel bad. But when you live up to the standard that you know is God's will, now your conscience can say go to it. That's right. And even when people persecute you, when you know you're doing right, as the Bible defines the right, you rest in your soul and have peace. 
But people don't understand that God knows how to get man from earth to heaven out of the schoolroom where we're tested and tried. How could we appreciate heaven? Let's just look this way. How could we form the benevolence and mercy that the Bible says Christians, those of Christ, members of the Lord's church, ought to have if there was not a place where people could need our mercy and need our benevolence and we recognize it and we just play it and carry it out? How can I understand about repentance if I have nothing to repent of? How can I control my anger if I don't have any control? How can I control my thoughts to bring them into subjection to the teachings of Christ if it's not possible to have thoughts contrary to the teachings of Christ? Then to recognize it and then go about changing myself to fit the pattern of God's truth. Yes, this world's perfect for what God made it to be. I need to understand what He made it to be and fit in. Fit myself into what's here. And His love allowed for man to make decisions all the time. And His infant knowledge saying most of them are going to choose wrong. And most of them are going to be lost. But I'm not willing that He should perish. And I've given man the ability to choose. And that means he has the ability to see his sins in the light of the truth understand what I've given him to believe and do from the heart to gain remission of those sins, change his life, and thus Joshua still rings down through the ages, choose you this day whom ye will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, if you're just an automaton or a robot, those words mean nothing. How can there be a proper disposition of forgiving others of their sins when they repented of them and complied with the will of heaven to gain remission if I don't have the power to forgive them? How can I be like God if I can't forgive people? How can I be like God if there's not a place where people can do things bad against me? So that I can cause them to try to see the way of salvation in the gospel. And then when they're obedient to the gospel, I, along with God, if it's been a personal sin against me, I forgive them. I lay it aside. I follow the example of God. Their sins and their iniquities, I'll remember no more. So when you look at life, if man was to be able to choose God and heaven and godly things over the world, he had to be made to be able to do that. If there are going to be choices, then somebody else had to offer him another way other than the Lord's way. Thus Satan operates in the world. And I'm expected to learn God's will and know the difference in what's right and wrong. But the thing I leave you with this morning is that God would not be a God of love if He had not made us to make choices. And when He made us to make choices, I am speak of mankind in general, there will be a host of people who will make bad choices, and by their choices, they'll hurt other folks. And God does not take away the freedom of man simply because some people do bad things. Freedom is not license. That's true. We have a perfect law of liberty, which mainly means we're set free from the Old Testament system and we have liberty in Christ. Where's the liberty? It's located in Christ. How do we get into that place where we're in the favor of God? We make a decision when we hear the gospel. We make a decision to abide by the terms of the gospel plan of salvation. We choose that. And then we choose, once we've been baptized in Christ for the remission of sins, to live the Christian life. This is the reason that people can get themselves so entangled in certain errors that they are unwilling to do the necessary repentance to come out of those errors. But even God gave us the opportunity by making us as He made us and putting in this world to where we must bear the, the problems. Whose fault is it that I've sinned? Is it God's? Well, to hear people reason this way, well, if He'd really loved us, He wouldn't have made it possible for people to sin. 
But God is love. And He did make it possible for people to sin. But He says, I will give you in the Word of God the way of life. Now you must determine whether that's the way you want to go or not. And I love you so much, I'm giving you that right to reject me or to receive me on my terms revealed in the Bible. Now it's interesting that the Bible closes, the Bible closes with these words in Revelation 22 beginning in verse 17. Just before the hand of inspiration is finished writing forevermore. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Now, what's that saying? I made you as you are in my image, a sense of oughtness, and the moral being that I am with the power to choose. I now appeal to you on the basis of your rational powers and your intellect to understand the way of righteousness. And you will make those decisions if you're honest, and that's another interesting aspect of our being. We can be dishonest. But he says, be honest. That means I can be. And I know the difference in honesty and dishonesty. And choose God on the basis of the truth that he's revealed to me through right division of it, through credible witnesses, adequate evidence, thinking soberly to comply with his will and thus bask in his love. Though he love everybody and have all men saved, he set up a situation where I can show him I love him. And how would you demonstrate to him you love him if you didn't have to make the decision to turn from error to truth? But there are those who will abuse this freedom God's granted us to make those choices. And they do it regularly. And they will be called into an accounting someday. You remember, and this I suppose is a good place to end this lesson as I can think of right now. You remember what Paul said to the church in Rome. Because there is a day of reckoning. There is a day of giving account to the choices you made. People want bad folks either not to have been given the opportunity to be bad folks. Or else they determine God ought to judge them immediately. But what is time to God, folks? The day is with the Lord's a thousand years, a thousand years a day. In God's mind, this, there's, there's no limiting or stretching out of time that binds us as finite beings in this present material world. We sometimes speak of people like the rich man in torment. And we'll say, you know, he was in torment when Jesus gave that. And now it's been 2,000 years he's been in torment. There's no time to him anymore. It may be for everybody that's entered into the Hadean world, just a, as we would say, and watch how I say it, a blink of the eye, and the end of the world's here. Because they don't, they don't measure things in eternity like we measure them. And keep that in mind. But listen to what is said. God will bring everybody into judgment because we're accountable for our actions to God. Now think about that. There couldn't be a judgment if God made us robots. But God put us in school on earth, perfect for what God made it to be, and He appeals to us on the basis of the way He made us, rational creatures, intellectual creatures, to understand His will in words that He revealed to us to tell us what's all about things. And then He says, you choose. And I can prove my faith in Him and my love in Him because I choose His way. And notice, for it is written, as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of, him, uh, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now what is that to God, whether he does it, as we would say this afternoon, 
or 10,000 years as we measure our time in the world from now. What is that to God? You see, he's not, time means nothing to him. He knows what he's going to do and he does it. He's controlled by time only in the sense that he put man in time and in dealing with man as he made man, then he must deal with him where he put him. And it must, therefore, since he created time, he must respect what he created and work with man as he made him in the time he put him in. And thus he must work with the limitations of man. But it doesn't affect God. Doesn't affect God at all. So before we begin to say, well, I think if everything ought to be, then you stop people completely in their tracks, make them where they have no choice, and that's where you get people beginning to say, we'll dictate your every thought and your every action. And that's their concept of freedom. It's not God's concept of freedom. <laughs> God's love and he created man in the beginning. The first main thing man did was use the way he created him and choose the wrong way. Why did he destroy everybody off the face of the earth then? So, oh, I've got to put in more restrictions. I've got to make it where man won't make a mess of things. You can't do that, brethren, not have a true freedom, not true liberty. So we'll give an account of how we used our time. We'll give account of how we used our minds. We'll give account of how we thought about things. We'll give account of how we studied the Bible. We'll give an account of our honesty or dishonesty to God. Because everything we are comes from God, and this world's a schoolroom, and there's that great day coming. When we will stand before Him at the judgment bar. And all those people who've said, well, I've known a better way than God, or God doesn't exist, or Jesus is not the Son of God, or the Bible's not the Word of God, they're an evil bow. And everything they've denied in life will be put out of the way. But they won't benefit from it. But they will confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Everybody in hell will fully believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But now is the time to choose. Now is the time to recognize that God is God. And he knows what he's doing when he made the world the way he made it. And he made a freedom that allows for man to make messes out of things. But he also gives us the way to heaven and says, I've placed it on your level of understanding. I haven't bypassed the way I made you. I appeal to you as your irrational person you are. And I'm begging you to think straight. Use time for what it ought to be used for to find God serving faithfully. Prepare your life for eternity. Yes, people are going to do bad things. And woe to them that do them, Jesus said. But it's necessary because there has to be a place where all men can make their choices. And God was not able to make a person to choose to go to heaven and take away from them the freedom to go to hell. Couldn't do it. It's against his nature. It's against everything that he is. If he wants to populate heaven with people who had never been there, but by reasoning and adequate evidence, credible witnesses, they chose to go there having never been there on the basis of the gospel message. Though most will choose to go the other direction. If you are using your mind properly, then think about the truth of God, that faith does come by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and believe in Christ on the basis of his word. Repent of your sins. Turn away from them. Resolve your heart from here on out. It'll be God's way and not my way. And if I find anything in my life in the future that's against God's way, I will immediately turn from it and embrace his way. That's the attitude of repentance. Then confess your faith in Christ, the Son of God. Complete your obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of your sins. That's God's way. There is no other. And if you're subject to his invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.